You are listening to the Gateway Church in Spring Lake, Michigan. To learn more, visit us at thegatewaygh.com. Today is a little bit different. We are we are going to dive into the book of Acts for the year 2018. We're going to take the year to kind of study the book of Acts and uh, and just and we're going to kind of break it down into four sections and kind of have four different series within the series, so to speak. And uh, uh, what we're going to do is we're going to just, we believe that the God's word is powerful. The book of Acts is an incredible story and, uh, and it's, it's great. And we're going to get there in a second. Uh, but today is, is a lot of kind of background and and I was talking with Pastor Bobby in between services and I said, while well, I was popping all those uh, uh, lifesavers, um, and I said, hey, you know, what can we do better? Because I felt like people were looking at me with the amount of scripture that I gave was like, what in the world? And uh, this is my encouragement. Uh, we're going to look at a lot of scripture, and I'm going to encourage you, and I'm going to kind of paraphrase some just because I, cause I don't want it to lose you, and I'm going to try not to lose you. Uh, but you can write some of these down and go back and study, and uh, that's part of that, what I was talking about at the beginning. Like, hey, I've got a part, you've got a part, and uh, God... He does his part, and it's pretty awesome, right? And so, um, anyway, we're going to study the book of Acts. In the book of Acts, we can start the recording now, right? If it, or we'll cut it there, right? The book of Acts. Uh, in some of your Bibles, it might say the Acts of the Apostles. And it's a book full of principles and how God works through His Spirit. And there's patterns for empowerment uh, for men and women and uh, patterns for building the church. And if you boil it all down, the book is about how the church was founded. And it's a neat story, and, uh, and it's going to be uh, really exciting to track through that. I want to set the stage this morning uh, and let you know that from my opinion and from some commentators as well, the book of Acts, instead of the Acts of the Apostles, could be called the Acts of the Holy Spirit. And I would say the Acts of the Holy Spirit through the disciples because God was using men and women but the Holy Spirit was working through them the Holy Spirit literally dominates the entire book of Acts 42 times the Holy Spirit is is written uh, and mentioned in the book of Acts the word spirit is seen another 15 times and so over and over and over we see uh, see this happen. Now, I want you to uh, turn with me to Acts chapter 1. And what I'd like to do in the next four or five minutes is take you through a list of verses. This is not exhaustive, but it will give you an idea of, of the, that the book of Acts is about the Holy Spirit. And it's seen from the, uh, chapter 1 all the way to the end, and we'll start in Acts chapter 1. Let's look at it. Acts chapter 1, verse 8. But you will receive power... When the Holy Spirit comes on you. And we're going to actually uh, study that part of Scripture this morning. In Acts chapter 2, all of them were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit enabled them. Acts 2.38, Peter replied, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Just in those three examples, you see there's power. Uh, they were filled with the Holy Spirit, spoken tongues. It's mentioned there's the gifts around this. In Acts chapter 4, uh, verse 8, we see again, Peter was filled with the Holy Spirit, and then he spoke, and the Spirit of God was leading him. And so the Holy Spirit's helping in speaking. In Acts chapter 6, verse 3, you can jot it down, they needed uh, leadership within the church, and they were looking for men full of the Holy Spirit, verse 3. Acts chapter 7, verse 55. Stephen was full of the Holy Spirit. Acts chapter 8, verse 29. Philip the evangelist uh, was um, uh, talking with the Ethiopian eunuch. And, and again, it was empowered. His sharing was through the power of the Holy Spirit. Turn with me to Acts chapter 10. Acts chapter 10, verse 44. This is great. Uh, uh, Peter is at Cornelius' house. In uh, verse 44, here it is. While Peter was still speaking these words, the Holy Spirit came on all 
who heard the message. So there's a, not only a speaking part, but the Holy Spirit enabled the hearers to hear. How many believe, let me just pause, that right here, right now, the Holy Spirit is enabling you to hear His Word? Isn't that a cool idea? I believe that. He opens up the Word and He lets us hear and see. You may have read Scripture before and it, it's been kind of dry, but today something's different and boom, the light's going out. That's the Holy Spirit enabling you to hear his word. A couple more. Uh, they were worshiping and fasting, Acts chapter 13. And Paul and Barnabas were, had some direction issues. And uh, if you've read the story, we're going to get to it at some point in the year. Uh, but uh, they, they, the Holy Spirit led them in different directions. Um, uh, Acts 16, verse 6, the same idea. Uh, Paul is, is heading to Rome. How did he get there? It was, he was being led by the Holy Spirit. Um, and then let's just look at one more uh, together. Well, you can write down Acts 19, 6. Uh, John the Baptist, his disciples come, and they are filled with the Holy Spirit. Kind of neat. Uh, but Acts chapter 20, verse 22 as well. It says, And now, compelled by the Spirit, I am going to Jerusalem, not knowing what will happen to me there. And there's a sense that we walk by the Spirit, that every step we take, the Holy Spirit uh, when we are in tune with him, he makes the difference. And so there's a lot of scripture. And what I want you to see in that little example, just those couple minutes there, is that it's not just one or two chapters that we see the Holy Spirit at work. It's all throughout. It, everything in Acts revolves around the Holy Spirit. Jesus said that we would do even more than he would ever, that we would ever even imagine. How does that happen? It happens through the power of the Holy Spirit. He fills us and baptizes us and sends us and empowers us to do miracles and he leads and everything that the church does is or should be in the spirit. Now, I want to pause here for a moment. I realize that our audience here, uh, that not all of us come from an Assemblies of God background. In fact, if you've come from an Assemblies of God background, uh, just raise your hand if, if that's kind of your background. Okay. All right. If you're not from an Assemblies of God background, raise your hand. All right, so maybe about half and half this service. Uh, first service is about a third Assemblies of God background, about two-thirds not. Uh, but regardless, if you're not from an AG background, uh, there are times that some that will, they'll say, oh, you're Assemblies of God, all you ever talk about is the Holy Spirit, right? And uh, we kind of get a bad rap, right? It, well, I've got some news. When it comes to the early church, that's all there is, is the Holy Spirit at work especially when you study the book of Acts. One commentator said, if you don't want to hear about the Holy Spirit, you don't want to hear about the early church. And I was like, ooh, I like that. And, uh, and I would just submit to us that we desperately need the Holy Spirit in our lives, individually and corporately. And I would say it's time for us to grow up. It's time for us to be discipled. And uh, the Lord is going to help us to do that. Now, for those of you that raised your hand saying, yep, I'm from an AG background or from a Pentecostal background, um, I, I want to just beware that the temptation might be there like, oh, I've studied that before or I've been there, done that in a lot of different arenas. Uh, listen, today is a new day, a fresh start. We need a fresh outpouring of the presence and the power and the moving of the Holy Spirit. Uh, I need it. You need it. And so don't disengage. Um, this is for all of us. And, uh, and we're excited about that. I mentioned earlier in my earlier comments that we're going to break the uh, book of Acts into four different chapters or different series. And, um, and we will, uh, I'm going to forego looking at those um, here. And uh, let's just dive in and kind of look at some of the background. Uh, let, me, let me just pray um, as we get into this. Lord, I pray that in the next few moments that you would receive all the glory and honor, that you would be speaking, and just like we read, that you were enabling hearers to hear your word. I pray that your Holy Spirit would do just that from the front to the back, side to side, and even in my life, God, help us to be able to not only hear, but then to put these words into action. We thank you for it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Well, 
a little quiz. Does anyone know who wrote the book of Acts? Just say it out loud if you know. Luke. That's right. The Gospel of Luke and the book of Acts were written by the, the apostle Luke. And what's neat about that is if you put that together, Luke and Acts, uh, which really it's a continuation of, of Luke. Acts is a continuation of Luke. Um, the two books go together. Uh, it should be Matthew, Mark, John, Luke, Acts, but it's not, but uh, whatever. But it's the longest gospel with Acts makes up the combination almost 25%, almost a quarter of the whole New Testament. It's interesting that Luke is the only Gentile writer of Scripture as well. When you look at the rest of Scripture and later in the New Testament, uh, we find out that Luke was a doctor. He was a physician. And uh, Colossians chapter 4, verse 14. And he is very factual when he writes Luke and Acts. Uh, He doesn't add his own feelings or his own opinion. He sticks to the facts. He's very objective and he's very accurate uh, as well. The other thing we know about Luke is that he was connected to the Apostle Paul. And the two of them traveled uh, on some missionary journeys. We see that in Acts 16, Acts 20, Acts 21, Acts 27. And we'll get to those probably in the fall. (laughs) That's later. Or probably eh, maybe in the spring. I'm not sure. Um, But uh, uh, Luke is writing so that people would understand Christianity. Uh, It was written about 30 years after Jesus was uh, taken into heaven, around 62, between 62 and 64 A.D., and, uh, and if you outline the book of Acts, uh, like we're going to do, uh, we're going to take seven to ten weeks in each of these areas, created with purpose, let's go ahead and just flash them quick, created with purpose, finding the purpose, living on purpose, and then the cost of purpose. And the idea with all this is to have a church with purpose, and the purpose comes from the Holy Spirit. Now, When we look at Acts chapter 1, we're going to dive in there. Turn with me there. Um, Acts 1, 1 1 through 11 is really the preamble or kind of the introduction, kind of where he left off in Acts, I'm sorry, in in Luke. And we're going to see that here briefly. Uh, But but the idea uh, here, well, let's just look at it. Acts 1, 1. It says, in my former book, Theophilus, I wrote about all that Jesus began to do and to teach. And we'll pause right there. Let's turn, to hold your finger at Luke, I mean at Acts, and let's turn to Luke chapter 1. Because we want to kind of get the whole picture, see how it all works together. It says at the beginning of Luke, it says, Many have undertaken to draw up the account of things that have been fulfilled among us, just as they were handed down to us by those from the first who are eyewitnesses and servants of the word. With this in mind, since I myself have carefully investigated everything, remember he's a doctor, uh, from the beginning, I too decided to write an orderly account to you, most excellent Theophilus, so that you may know the certainty of the things you have been taught. You're saying, who is this Theophilus guy? In the first four verses of Luke, in the first verse of, of Acts, we see him. Well, most likely he was a Roman uh, guard or a Roman official, very wealthy, most likely. He was definitely a patron. He was a follower of Jesus. And what's great is, as I studied this, it is very possible that Luke was paid to write this by Theophilus, that he was actually kind of in a contractual idea to say, hey, write this out for us. And you think about it, the Holy Spirit was worked through men to write God's word, but someone got paid in the mix. It's kind of, my mind was blown. And, uh, but anyway, totally off subject and probably lost everyone there. Anyway, uh, back to Acts chapter one. So in my former book, Theophilus, I wrote about the things Jesus began to do and to teach verse two, until the day he was taken up to heaven after giving instruction through the Holy Spirit to the apostles he had chosen. And so we see this, this idea that he was taken into heaven. And so you look at the end of Luke, and you don't have to turn there, uh, but I will just quick. At the end of uh, Luke, we see that exactly what happens. Then he opened their minds. uh, This is Jesus talking to the disciples after he's been risen from the grave. 
so that they could understand Scripture. Again, the Holy Spirit at work, and so the Holy Spirit was revealing Scripture. It's pretty neat. He told them this. He says, uh, this is what I was written. The Messiah will suffer and rise from the dead on the third day, and repentance and forgiveness of sins will be preached in his name to all the nations, beginning at Jerusalem. And you'll see some ties between what he's saying here in Acts chapter 1 in just a second. The, and then it says, you will be witnesses of these things. I am going to send you what my Father has promised, but stay in the city until you have been clothed with power on high. And then in the last couple of verses, he's risen or he's taken up he, the ascension of Jesus. He's taken up into the clouds and it says they worshiped, they stayed there. Uh, they, let, or they went to Jerusalem with great joy and then they stayed continually at the temple praising God. Now you go back to Acts chapter 1 and you're saying, well, what's happening here? What's going on? We see that happen in Acts chapter 1, verse 9, 9 through 11. It's the ascension story. And uh, they're all looking into the clouds, and, uh, the, and they're saying, man, where did Jesus go? We saw him in the clouds. Two angels appear, and they say, look, Jesus, he's not here, but he's coming back again. He will come back the way that he went, and, uh, and all of that. There's something, though, in verse 2 that I've got to make uh, a, a point about. It says, until the day he was taken up to heaven after giving instructions through the Holy Spirit. And what I want you to see here for a moment is that the Holy Spirit and Jesus, they worked together. The Spirit was moving in and through the life of Jesus. Jesus became a man. He was fully God, fully, fully man. And on his humanity side, everything that Jesus did was empowered by the Holy Spirit. In Luke chapter 4, verse 1, at his baptism, it says the Holy Spirit came upon him. And uh, in Luke chapter 4, verse 14, um, again, we see the Spirit of God is present in Jesus' ministry. In Luke chapter uh, 4, verse 18, in fact, I'll read this one. He opens up the scroll. He says, the Spirit of the Lord is upon me. And because he has anointed me to proclaim the good news. So again, he was full of the Holy Spirit. In Luke chapter 5, verse 17, uh, again, one day Jesus was teaching the Pharisees. They had come from the villages, from all over. And the power of the Lord was with Jesus to heal the sick. Where did that power come from? It came from the Holy Spirit. In, in Luke chapter 10, verse 21, uh, Jesus sends out the 72 and with great joy and power. All was, was uh, sent by the Holy Spirit at work within them. If you got your place in uh, Acts chapter 1, hold your finger there. Turn with me to John chapter 5 for a second. John chapter 5, verse 19. And I know there's a lot of verses. You can write them down, look them up a little later if you want. Uh, John chapter 5, verse 19. This is what Jesus, the, they're asked, the Pharisees are saying, well, tell us, are you the Son of God? Um, are you really you know, who you say you are? And, and what he says here is incredible. That what I want you to see is that Jesus didn't do anything without the Holy Spirit at work inside of him. Look what it says. Jesus answered them, Very truly I tell you, the Son can do nothing by himself. He can only do what he sees his father doing because the father does, the, or whatever the father does, the son also does. And the way he was empowered was through the Holy Spirit. And so this is important for us to get. Uh, we, we know that Jesus was full of the Holy Spirit and it may, that was the difference maker in Jesus' ministry. And by the way, that's the difference maker for us as his disciples. All right? All right, let's go back to Acts chapter 1, verse 3. It says, After his suffering, he presented himself to them and gave many convincing proofs that he was alive. And again, Jesus went around and uh, appeared to many people, sometimes as many as 500 at a time, and uh, saying, hey, I'm risen, I'm here. It was the proof, and, uh, and uh, Acts is, or Luke is recording this here in the first part of Acts. It says he appeared to them over a period of 40 days, and he spoke about the kingdom of God. Verse 4, on one occasion, so he's around with his disciples, uh, he was eating with them, and he gave them this command, and look what it says. 
Do not leave Jerusalem, but wait for the gift my Father promised, which you have heard me speak about. He said to wait. He says, don't leave. I've got a gift for you. I've got something special for you. He said to wait, to rest for something that they didn't even understand. At that point, they were like, okay, what are we waiting for? And they didn't know, but they later realized that Jesus had been talking all throughout the Gospels that he was going to send the Holy Spirit. He promised the Holy Spirit. In Luke chapter 11, verse 13, he said, God will give the Holy Spirit uh, to those who, who ask. In Luke chapter 24, verse 49, which we already read, the promise of the Holy Spirit would be coming. In the book of John, uh, the big time, John 14, John 15, 16, uh, there's a big section on the promise of the Holy Spirit. Again, we see these verses. You can write them down and uh, read those later. And what we see is that Jesus had been telling his disciples that he was going to be sending the Holy Spirit. And so here he says, do not leave, but wait for the gift my father promised. They didn't know what it was, but then he says in verse 5, for John baptized with water, but in a few days you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit. Again, they didn't know what that meant, And they're questioning themselves and what was going through their mind. Well, we see it in verse 6. Let's look at it. It says, Then they gathered around him and asked him, Lord, are you at this time going to restore the kingdom of Israel? In other words, they're saying, Hey, this is it. You came back from the grave. This means war. We're going to take over. We're we're going to bring your kingdom here. We're going to set up your kingdom here. And they're thinking about the future. And they wanted Jesus' help. And they're like a lot of us, that we want Jesus' help. We're, and we might be thinking of the future. In 2018, think about what's coming. And, there's, and we're, we might say even to Jesus, hey, Jesus, we're ready. Let's go. Let's show us the plan. I'm ready to move. And what does Jesus say? He says to wait, verse 4. And in verse 7, he corrects them. He says, wait. He says, it's not for you to know the times or the dates the Father has set by his own authority. And then in verse 8, look what it says, but he gives them a little clue of what's about to come. You will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. What Jesus does, he paints a picture at this point of what's to come. He says, okay, he's not giving them the promise right there because he hasn't left in this account because then right after that, then the ascension goes into heaven, verses 9 through 11, and you can read that on your own. But God leads step by step. He doesn't give the full picture, but he gives a a kind of a, 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 a partial picture saying, hey, this is what's about to happen. You'll receive power, and when you do, you will be my witness. And the disciples, I'm sure, are saying, how are we going to do this? Where are you going? And it was really Jesus saying, look, it's all through the Holy Spirit. It wasn't going to be some obligation. No one twisted the arms of the disciples to share the good news. It wasn't out of guilt, that's for sure. Uh, where they were guilted into sharing or going to give their lives, which uh, many of the disciples did for Jesus. He didn't lay out a formula, say, hey, this is how you do it, and, and, uh, or he didn't oversimplify it and say, just keep it to these three things or anything like that. He didn't lay out a program. It was the Holy Spirit revealing himself in each of those disciples that spread the work of the gospel and continued the name of Jesus being shared. See, God's concern is not always six months ahead, but he gives us power for the moment. Everything else is secondary other than what God is doing in moments even like this morning. And the key was found in verse 4. I want you to see. 
the key there is that we are to wait on the Holy Spirit. We want to go, 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 right? Uh, I'm kind of like that. I like to be active. I like to um, I think of things. But God says, don't run ahead. Instead, wait. A church with purpose waits for the Holy Spirit's direction and then goes after it. We're created with purpose, fueled by the Holy Spirit, and Lord help us to do that. We've got to be filled with the Holy Spirit first. See, we can kind of run and get our own ideas and, and uh, kind of uh, say, hey, this is what we're going to do or this is how it's going to work, and, and we put all these things in our mind. And then we say, oh, and by the way, God, would you help us to do all these things? How many have ever done that? I know I have. Instead, the instruction here in Acts 1 is to wait, get a word from the Lord, get direction from Him, and then move with confidence. That's the, where the power comes, is when we're listening and doing what he says. Now, for some that are here, you may feel a little squirmish, saying, boy, that, that sounds kind of scary. Uh, waiting on God, or hearing the voice of God, or you know, being you know, where the Holy Spirit will come on you and fill you, and, or things like that. that and, and, and maybe some of you know, have read ahead with Acts, and uh, you're, you're saying, boy, this makes me a little uncomfortable. I, w- I want you to, to know that this is not the first time in Scripture that this has happened. In fact, when I was looking for an Old Testament example, uh, one kind of popped up, and I, as I studied it, I was like, man, this is incredible. In fact, I want you to turn with me to 1 Samuel chapter 10. 1 Samuel chapter 10, the prophet Samuel uh, has anointed the first king of Israel. Does anyone know who the first king of Israel was? King Saul, that's right. If you said anything else, you're wrong, but it was Saul, that's right. Uh, Saul was anointed, or Samuel anointed Saul, the first king, and then there was a time of preparation uh, in Saul's life, and we get a little picture of it in chapter 10, starting in verse 5. Let's look at it. It says, After that you will go to Gibeah of God, where there is a Philistine outpost. As you approach the town, you will meet a procession of prophets coming down from a high place with lyres and trembles and and pipes and harps being played before them, and they will be prophesying. Can you imagine Saul kind of heading heading out and then seeing these prophets coming down and playing instruments and prophesying? I mean, that'd be a pretty neat picture if you can get that in your mind. Then look what verse 6 says. The Spirit of the Lord will come powerfully upon you and you will prophesy with them. Whoa! And you will be changed into a different person. Hold on just a second. The Spirit will come powerfully. You will begin to prophesy. This is the king to be. Think of what Saul might have been thinking in that. He's saying, whoa, all right, the Spirit's going to come on me, I'm going to prophesy. He says, you'll be changed into a different person. And then look how it finishes. Once these signs are fulfilled, do whatever your hand finds to do, for God is with you. It's the perfect picture of waiting on God, the power comes on Him, and then the release to say, look, now you can go and do whatever your hand finds to do, for God is is with you. And I believe that that's what God wants for us, to wait on Him. I have my notes here, and you can come now, Pastor Bobby. Waiting proceeds doing. We've got to wait. And it will change. It changed Saul into a different person. You're saying, that sounds scary, right? Listen, it's not scary. He was still himself, but now the Holy Spirit was working through him. And I believe as we track into the book of Acts in the year 2018, God is going to get a hold of our lives and we will not be the same because of the power and the presence 
of the Holy Spirit. And I'm excited to journey with you. He, Saul was changed into a different person. You will not be the same at the end of 2018 than you are right today. But it starts with this idea of waiting. Let's pray. Lord, I pray that over these next couple moments as we wrap up this service, the first service of the year, my prayer is, Lord, that you would just challenge each of us to wait, to let your presence come upon us, to fill us, and then to do. Waiting precedes doing. God, I pray that we would not come up with all these plans and then ask you to help us. Instead, we would say, Lord, we want to be in your presence and only do what you want us to do. And Lord, I pray that for, for the church, but I also pray for every single individual that's here. And we're asking that you do this in Jesus' name. With your head continued to be bowed and eyes closed, I just want to acknowledge that one of the things that the Holy Spirit does is He gently convicts us of sin. The Holy Spirit is the one that leads us to repentance, to salvation. And I know this is not a salvation message per se, but I want to give the opportunity that if you're here and you do not know Jesus as your personal Savior, the Holy Spirit is working on side of, inside of your life right now. You can sense it right now. And He's stirring inside of you and He's convicting you of your sin. The Bible is very clear that all have sinned, all have fallen short of the glory of God. That means that even uh, the best among us, we're all sinners. It also says in Scripture that there's no sin allowed in heaven. And so if you're a sinner, you can't get to heaven unless you are covered with the blood of Jesus. When Jesus died on the cross, his, the blood that was shed, it covers your sin when you receive him. And if you would like to receive Jesus this morning as your personal Savior, I want you just to lift your hand right where you are. Yeah, absolutely. Who else? On this first Sunday of the year. Say, man, if I were to die today, I'm not sure I'd go to heaven. I want to get that settled right now, right here. Or maybe you've been a believer and you've kind of walked away from the Lord you're saying, man, I need to renew that relationship. You can lift your hand as well. I want to pray with you. Yeah, thanks. Who else? Yes, absolutely. I see that. Thank you. Anyone else before we pray? Okay. Yeah, thanks. Wow. The Holy Spirit is working right here, right now. As far as I see it, there's four, maybe five that have raised their hands. And for the sakes of these, and some of these are rededications, but others may be first time, could I just lead you in a sinner's prayer? It's not the words of this prayer that are going to save you. It's really believing it in your heart. Would you just pray after me? And everyone, let's do this together. Say, Dear Heavenly Father, I'm sorry for the things I've done wrong, for the sin in my life. Please take away my sin and make me clean. I believe that you've died on the cross and that you rose from the grave and I put my faith in you. Thank you for salvation, for saving me. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. And for the several that rededicated or gave their hearts to the Lord, we rejoice and uh, God is moving. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. I'm going to ask that everyone stand and where I want to just kind of end our time this morning with this idea that we can grow in our waiting. Waiting is not a modern American value. In our society, we want things quick, we want things now, the faster, the more efficient. But I'm telling you, when it comes to the presence of God, there's something about waiting. There's something about being in His presence. 
and letting them work inside of us. And I personally want to be that type of person that is in his presence. And the great thing is, is that the presence of God, it goes with us. It doesn't hold us back. It goes with us. I want to just share a quick story and uh, just hang on for a second. Um, when I was a teenager, I was, uh, we had Sunday night church, and uh, some of you might remember that. And it wasn't youth group night, it was just Sunday night church, and we went most of the time. And uh, I remember one Sunday night, that I was just, I remember being in the presence of God and I seriously did not want to leave. I didn't want to leave church. I was, I didn't really move up to the altar. I just kind of stood and was worshiping just where I was and I think I was probably crying at different times and people are clearing out and all of a sudden it's me and maybe just a couple other people. One of the, one of the pastors came up to me and was like, uh, are you okay? Is there anything I can pray with you about? I'm like, no, I'm good. I just want to be here in the presence of God. And he kind of left me alone. My parents made me, forced me to leave because they were ready to go. I, I remember thinking, I don't want to leave this present. I didn't, I want, and I know now, according to Scripture, that the presence of God can go with you. <laughs> and I'm grateful for that. But that hungry heart that I had at a young age, that's the type of heart I want to have today. And my heart is for you to have the same. We're going to sing this song, just kind of set our hearts. You can move to the altar if you want. You can stay where you are. At the end of this song, I'll have a closing uh, benediction. But, uh, but just let the Lord start working in you with this idea that we wait on Him. And uh, let Him fill you up. And then we're going to go here in a minute. But, uh, but Pastor Bobby, just lead us, and uh, we'll close our time with this song. I'm going to freak some of you out here. I'm going to ask that you change your position of worship here just for a moment. So if you're standing, maybe you sit or kneel, or if you want to move out into the aisle just for a moment, or come to the altar, that's fine. I just believe that as we take a move and as we make a difference, some of you grew up in a tradition where you're used to kneeling, and I want to encourage you to, to go back to those roots here for a moment. Because the presence of God is here, and He's wanting to speak directly to your heart in this next moment before we close. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. God, as we change our position strategically, in this moment, God, I pray that as we have just moved, we've just made a change, God, I pray that it will be more than just a physical change or a physical move, but Lord, there's something happening in the heavenlies in regards to our lives and what you have for us this year. And from this moment forward, I believe we will be different. Empowered by your Holy Spirit. And over the next few weeks, Lord, we're going to create space in the services to really hear your voice. And, but Lord, even right now, I pray that you would speak to us. That you would help us, Lord, I pray. God, that you would just do an incredible work and God, just like when Samuel was anointed king, I'm sorry, when Saul was anointed king, Samuel said to go and that the Spirit of the Lord will come powerfully among or upon you. You will prophesy and you will be changed into a different person. God, I pray that that will be the truth for each and every person here. God, do your work. Breathe on us, Lord. Breathe on us, Lord.
We thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Just begin to thank the Lord for his presence and his power. His Holy Spirit, even at work in this moment, God, thank you, Lord, for what you're doing inside of us. God, we just want to yield to you. We want to wait in your presence. Oh, we wait for you, Lord. We thank you, God. Oh, Holy Spirit, we bless your name as we wait. We're waiting, Lord, for you. Move in our hearts, oh Lord. Oh, as we wait on you. Oh, we'll wait on you. Thank you for listening to this week's message from the Gateway Church. If you'd like to find out more about our church, such as service times, giving, and ways to get connected, visit us at thegatewaygh.com.